So uh, after a childhood and adolescence of experimenting, taking apart the gears on three-speed bikes, hunting and fishing, doing everything that counted as science, including, frankly, getting pretty high marks in science, top of the class, all that stuff in high school. I found myself as a freshman at Stanford in a very large undergraduate lecture hall called Chemistry One. It looked something like this. And I was came in a little late, and I was about right here, which is why I'm standing here now. I was about at this place in the lecture hall. I confess I was standing at first, and then I, and I sat because there was no place to sit. It was full. And it was clear that there was only so many seats in the room. I didn't get it. I didn't get from day one. I didn't know what the lecture was talking about. I didn't know where I fit in. I felt very much behind, and before too long, I did find the exit door, which should be the next slide. It'll come, I hope. Maybe not. I found the exit door. I found the exit door, not only this exit door, out of the classroom, but after a few section meetings, Right, a few study sessions, I, and even that's, that when I was when I was there, you could drop out of a course the day before the final. Sweet, <laughs> um, <laughs> I dropped out of that course, and I actually found the exit door out of natural sciences altogether. That had been why I found the college, and I found my own way out of the natural sciences. So, when I did try to enter, and I occasionally did, um, maybe this will work. When I did try to re-enter the classroom, as I occasionally did, maybe we'll just do it manually. Yeah. Next slide. As I as I re-entered the classroom, um, or tried to re-enter the, the subject area, it was as if there was a, you know, a, a now not just an exit door, but a kind of do not enter sign. Right. I didn't. It didn't take long before I clearly had no seat. If you get no seat in Chem One, right, you don't have a seat in any of the subsequent Chem classes. It wasn't just that there was no seat actually physically for me, not because I didn't take Chem 1. It's actually that I, there was no place for me in the natural sciences. This is beginning to sound like a much sadder story than I knew it to be. Uh, it, but it did suck, right? I mean, here was something that I absolutely loved. When I went home, I would, I still had my microscope set. I would get seawater and throw it near the water. And I'd get seawater and see what kind of plankton I could find, right? I was that kind of kid. You, you, I think actually a lot of kids are just exactly this graph through. They're all that way to some degree. Anyway, there was a kind of a bread and the sign, a, a do not enter sign for me in the natural sciences. I did actually eventually find my way into um, Stanford's version of cognitive anthropology, which is a very narrow subfield of anthropology and an even narrow, narrower field within that field, working with a man named Chuck Frake and subsequently uh, Shirley Bressy from Raymond Dirk. I mean, these amazing people, but I found a place, right? I found a place. Um, that got me from uh, my sort of no seat into a seat. Um, it got me into the classroom. I was a fifth grade teacher right after graduation. I went, I did Kent Cognitive Anthropology, called it International Relations so that it sounded fancier, and eventually got a job teaching elementary school in Long Beach. Um, I did that for a few years. I had lots of puzzles, things that I wanted to figure out. I still love teaching science. Um, I moved up to CARP, I taught school in CARP, and then I found my way into graduate school. Um, through three years or so into graduate school, I found myself in a place we used to call the salt mines, which was the basement of Coverly Hall. Okay. Um, it was really hot, but I got an office. And I spent hours and hours there uh, for doing what I had been told to do, but eventually chose to do in my dissertation work, which was analyzing conversations. Okay. So the work that I did while I was there involved uh, listening on headphones really slowly over and over again to tape recordings of conversation. I was actually going to put a cassette tape up here, but I wasn't sure what the audience was. And the people would be like, what's that? Is that a video tape? <laughs> In any case, the headphones actually look something like this. Um, the, I, I was listening in particular to a conversation that I wound up writing this very long dissertation about this one conversation among uh, some adolescents in a high school who were discussing whether or not uh, a black man should defend the rights of the Ku Klux Klan. When I had been present for this conversation, it felt um, 
almost like sorcery. Something was happening that felt just right, just like just what I wanted for my own self, the kinds of conversations I wanted to be engaged in, the kind of conversations, frankly, that as a teacher of fifth grade students, and then fourth grade and other students, that I had actually one of my students to engage in. It felt magical, but I didn't have a way to understand it, so I just listened. And I tried to listen carefully, and I sought the guidance of um, some incredible mentors and advisors. It took me a very long time to, to begin to understand how to, how to unpack it. One of the things you had to do was transcribe it. And I remember this moment when I had actually already transcribed it. And I was looking, it was, it was such serendipity. I was looking at this uh, one exchange in, in this long transcript that had taken, if those of you who have transcribed any kind of conversation analysis style, it's really slow. It's a very long transcript. And this one line that, that seemed the kids were going to fight but then they didn't wind up fighting, and I was trying to make sense of it. And at that very moment, I was listening to a piece of music by Thelonious Monk, a recording of In Walk Bud. In the middle of this In Walk Bud, this piece, I heard this, what sounded like a mistake. So I put down my work, and I went back into the, I started to put down the, the analysis of this transcript, and I started listening to this jazz piece again, and then I couldn't find it. I started listening to this mistake, and going, rewinding, and going forward, and, I, and then I found it again, and then I lost it again. I, it's not that I couldn't hear the note, but I, I, it was hard for me to hear it as a mistake. The closer I paid attention to it, the harder it was to hear this one note as a mistake in the context of the notes in which it had been played. And I went back to the transcript, and I realized, oh my god, this was going on here. That I had been looking for it as a mistake, as a fight, but it turned out it wasn't a fight. It was, but it was that they were playing together. They had figured out, these kids had figured out how to challenge each other in a way that was super confrontational, but then to frame it over and over again as playful work. I was delighted. Have you had that feeling when you did your own work? Even now I can recall it. Like really, I feel, I feel a little light inside. Have you had that, if you haven't had that experience in your own work, go find some work that will help you do that. Right? Be alert for it. That kind of delight. It was the same delight, frankly, that I had when I figured out how to have a three-speed gear on it worked um, my, for my first time. I took apart that three-speed gear in my garage that I had gotten off the bike that I bought in the thrift store. That same thrill, right? So I had this very different experience moving into the field of cognitive anthropology and doing some of this work. I found delight again. It was scientific. It was I would like to think it was pretty hardcore. It was rigorous. It got me a job here. It was in 2001. Rather than a no passe sign, rather than a do not enter sign, I think what it felt like, I to train this around, I think what it felt like um, was that I had grown into a field. I had grown like kind of like roots, right? Kind of like roots into stone. I had kind of grown into the field, and the field had begun to nourish me. It wasn't just that I was a member, that I had a seat in the room, or that I was a part of a community of scholars, all of which I felt like were true. But it was actually that my, my engagement with a field was different. And frankly, my engagement with children became real different, and my engagement with others became different. My whole experience of being in the world was, frankly, transformed by my close attention, guided by a discipline, my close attention to the phenomenon of everyday life. Okay? So for me, the image of a no passe sign, a do not enter sign, is contrasted, which for me, of this kind of a deepening of my own experience as a scholar, it's, it gets to be addictive. Those of, I know some, some of the work of some of the people in this room. Um, you know, a, a scholar of writing who can't stop thinking about writing and unpacking writing, and seeing how writing works, seeing what writing does to the writer. Right? I imagine, there, I don't know how many professors are in this room. Ages, visible ages, certainly no predictor of who's a professor. But I would bet that if you surveyed your own professors, they would describe experiences like this within their field. Right, these moments of discovery. It wasn't as if I had discovered in this conversation something that had never happened before. It never happened among these kids before. But I was discovering it for myself for the first time. Right? Not only did I have an entry into a field, but I had actually grown into the world in a new way, enabled by my field. That is the kind of learning that I'd like to think we want for other people and not just for ourselves. As educators, it's the kind of learning we want for our students. So I just have this contrast. right? Come on. Oh, thanks. Let's see if it works. This one doesn't work. It's just a little slow. This one doesn't work either. Oh, there it went. Ah, I see. There we go. I'll speed it up. 
as I got, you know, talking about this and thinking about this, I actually started to think that maybe it wasn't just that there was a no passe or no entrance sign. It's that I thought it was a little more complex than that, not just psychologically, but socially, right? I'm quite clear about what I want for myself and for my own students, and frankly, as a parent for my own children. It's what I want for you. It's what I think professors experience, what I think scholars experience inside their fields, this kind of root rooting into the world. Um, it wasn't just that I didn't have a seat. It's that the reason I didn't feel like I had a seat is not because I told you that I didn't really understand what was going on. Actually, that's not too much of a problem. I didn't understand what was going on in this conversation either, right? I mean, I was listening to this conversation on these headphones super slow. I didn't know, was, I didn't know really know how to do it. I didn't really know what was going on. It's not just that I didn't understand what the equations were on the board. I mean, heck, I didn't really understand how a three-speed gear worked until I took it apart, right? It wasn't so much that I didn't get it. Those of you who read Carol Dweck will probably start wondering, did he have a fixed mindset or a growth mindset? Right? Ten years ago, he might have said, maybe he just lacked self-efficacy. It actually wasn't that. It was actually that I walked in, and I, and I, I said I felt like I was, had lost already. I felt like that I was, I was entering a race that had already begun, or that if I was going to begin this race, I was clearly not fast enough to keep up. Right? So, so it wasn't just that I didn't understand, it's that I felt like I didn't belong. And furthermore, that learning it was going to be like a race that I had no chance even of getting a participation room. Right? Literally, didn't have a place, not just a seat, but a place, a rank. And knowing that, feeling that, believing that I had already lost, meant that I wasn't even going to enter the field. Now, that may be a whole other kind of psychological issue. That is, if you feel like you're going to lose, that you don't play. I don't know. I, maybe that's stuff I need to work out in therapy. In time. Not <laughs> but the point is that the reason that I felt this do not enter sign was that this do not enter sign was that I had actually felt like I was losing a race. And that it had been a race that had started long before I got there. Okay, there we go. All right. So, I want this. Okay, I don't want this. So before we go on, I'm going to interrupt myself in this talk. And I'm going to say um, that, that if, you, if you are a teacher, who wants, uh, who, who's okay with your own class sorting students into the students who could go on and the students who can't go on, right? Or you're comfortable with the fact that when you distribute the grades on your, in your class, it turns out to be kind of a normal curve. I still don't get how that, I, I'm so dissatisfied with that, <laughs> that. Because how would I be okay if, you know, the majority of the kids only got average in the field? I'm not okay. But if, you're, if, you, if, if you are of the mind that that's okay, then the rest of the talk, uh, you may find another place for it on your shelf than the place I hope for it. If you're okay with some people are going to win and some people are going to lose, then, and that's just the way it is, then you're probably going to have to figure out another place for, this, for the rest of the talk. Um, likewise, if, if you... I'm going to up the ante a little bit. If if you feel like education, if you feel like teaching, is a is a burden that you must bear, rather than a relationship and an honor, that's kind of an honorable relationship to be invited into. This is also a problem. All those all that stuff is is a kind of assumption. I realized as I was preparing for the talk, I thought well, I have some underlying assumptions I need to make clear. Um, this oh there it is. So. That's what that's for, right? Let's pause for a second and say, like, don't go forward thinking that you're going to get answers to the questions of how do you grade more efficiently along a curve, or how do you make sure that the smart kids move on and that you more efficiently weed out the kids who aren't able. Okay? Because for me, that's not the point. That's maybe a byproduct of the way you set up education, but that's not the point. The point for me is to help people grow roots into a field. There's an almost no greater thrill than to be sitting shoulder to shoulder with somebody as they see something that I haven't seen in some data that I've already been analyzing for years. Wow. So, but if you are on board, man, let's do this, okay? All right, so uh, you do have a job to do, which is uh, in the rest of the talk, um, and your job is to be a doubter, right? To be 
someone who says, yes, but, or <clears throat> I'm not so sure. Or So I want you to actually keep track of those things as the talk goes on, where you're saying, you know, to, because I'm going to try to pause every once in a while and ask you to, to feed those back into, into the group. Like, sure, what you say is great, or actually I think you're full of it, you know, and here's why. Okay, so that's your job moving forward. Okay, so those are the kind of basic assumptions, and here's what we do moving forward. With all that in mind, I want you to spend two minutes either thinking quietly, you can do that, or writing, or even better, although this doesn't make you a better person, but it would be really cool for me if you just talk to each other. Um, not just about like, the delicious cookies, <laughs> although that might, be, that might be a nice place to start, but actually where you are so far after 10 minutes of my talk. Will you do that for me? All I need is one. Great. <laughs> Great. Spend a couple of minutes talking to each other. I'll be back. Now, we do that. containing a ton of my exuberance about this talk. <laughs> I'm very, I'm so excited about this stuff that there's a couple of choices. Either I can go super fast and try to involve you in a conversation, which is what I really want, or I'll just keep talking and fill the air because I'm so excited. Um, I'll, I'll try to do the former, not the latter. But before I go on, what, do you, what did you hear? What did you think in the last couple of minutes? No, there's absolutely no wrong answers, you see. Yeah? Well, I was struck by your saying that you felt Do I hear that? What do you guys think about that? Anything? You didn't? I'll try to repeat it and then, and then, uh, yeah. So, so the idea that struck by the idea that I felt behind and then uh, is sort of acknowledging, right? Helps you acknowledge that, that some of the students we got come in are, are just, are in fact behind. They just don't have the resources or don't have the experience or don't have et cetera, right? And that we have to carry the burden of that. I want to add on to it and only say some of the some of the hardest students to teach are the ones who've been ahead the whole time, <laughs> right? And have tons and tons of resources, right? I'm not. This is to add to your point. In addition, right? The students who actually have that was me. Like I, man, I was I'd killed it in high school, right? That, that's not bragging. That's objectively, right? Ranking. I got into the good school, etc. And I came in and I was like, I'm so far behind. I am behind. Not I don't know. Not really. I don't get it. But I don't get it. And therefore, and given this group, I'm behind, right? So the inexperience, one of the things we have to contend with in addition to the students who come in, yes, in fact, behind or maybe without the requisite skills to move ahead, is that we have to think about the students who are ahead but don't know how to deal with the fact that 
they might find themselves not getting it from time to time, right? And in some cases, I teach big under, classes on undergraduate students like some of you guys do too, and one of the hardest things that students themselves have to grapple with is that their own biography, that in some, for a lot of the students, too many of the students, too many, that's me, me saying, too many of the students, where they find themselves entering UCSB is not really where they want to be, but they've chosen the path that guarantees them a record of high achievement that will enable them to get in. So that what's happened for them is that they've, when they've had something that's been especially difficult, they go, shit, I might get a B. I can't afford that. Right? I'll focus on this other thing. Right? And so I've, over, I, the, the greatest example of this, in addition to the people who, in fact, don't have, I use math as an example, who don't have the requisite or prior skill in math, there's a bunch of students, the ones that worry me even more are the ones that come in and say, I'm just not a math person. I'm a high achiever, but I'm not a math person. Which always sounds a little silly to me. How many people, just really quick, how many of you are not math people? Raise your hand. You can confess. A lot, that's a, this is a great percentage. Typically, it's more. Tim, you math? Okay. <laughs> He's my, the writing guy I was just telling you about. A bunch of usually, in a typical undergraduate class, especially an education class, tons of people raise their hands and say, I'm not a math person. And that, I just said, that sounds crazy. And the story that I often tell is the following. I have three children, and when my children stood up and fell down, right? You've, you've seen this with kids, right? You've seen, just not. You've seen kids stand up and fall down, right? <laughs> right? They, they, right? They, it doesn't happen easy, right? They don't go from crawling to, to like, man, I got this. Right? They stand up and they go like, whoa, whoa, and they fall down. And can you imagine if our response with that, to that was, I guess you're just not a walker. <laughs> That'd be crazy, right? It doesn't mean, so, so we, either we've accepted that math is somehow some, not the same as walking. It's sort of naturally hard. Or we've accepted or allowed them to accept that success in math is that you get there first. You get to the right answer first that a lot of students have built this idea that they're not math people, which usually means that they're not as fast or as accurate as other people. I've done it in lots of different talks where we play a game called Around the World. Do you know Around the World? You guys know Around the World? It was the most awful common game that I ever played in school. Um, I was fast, so it was great for me. Well, you stand next to somebody and, and the teacher says, gives you like a multiplication problem. The first person who gets, see now people are like, oh yeah, we called it something different. <laughs> Death game. Were, and you, then you move on, and you stand, stand behind the next person and get a new problem, right? So there are plenty of students who, who in addition to the students who are underprepared, right, who are, in fact, behind, there's a whole bunch of students who the minute that they see themselves as behind, that, that they understand their difficulties in a, in, a, in a subject area as being behind somebody else, that they then build that into an understanding of their own self and the subject matter as hard and incompetent. Right? Hard subject matter, incompetent. And that to me is, I, I, I'm not, I don't think I'm exaggerating or being dramatic to say I think that's absolutely tragic. Math is gorgeous. Gorgeous. It's gorgeous. Right? But <laughs> some people are like, yeah, it's easy for you to say. I'm not a math person. Okay, we got the rest of the talk to work on that. Okay, so any other thoughts? Any other thoughts? In the little interlude. Told you it's trouble. I, one thought and I went off. Ah, did you all hear that? You might not have heard in the back. The goodness. You did your comment. What's your name? Lisa. And what's your name? Lisa. Mary and Lisa. So Lisa's comment was like being a member of a community feels really good. Damn right. It feels, it feels, it feels like home, right? I mean, we seek it out. Yes. Let's, I want to hold on to that, right? Because I want to turn that into a question that I, I want to animate the rest of the talk. And, and that question is, what can we as teachers do? Because this is about teaching, right? It's not just about an indictment of the way people learn in their experience in school. It's not just autobiographical. Ought to be wise. So what, do what can we do as teachers? I'm going to leave you with that question at the end, but I'm also going to try to address some of that as a group. Okay, so um, I think what happens is it goes to sleep. Oh, there we go. Okay, so we did this. We don't need to do this anymore. The idea is we definitely want that for our students, or I definitely want that for our students. I'm going to take a risk and say that you too uh, want that for your students. Okay? Now, how do, what, why, do we, why do we get one and not the other? So I'm going to do some, some com sort of contrast sets. One idea is that the way, reason you get the do not enter no passe sign, right, 
is that the kid, in this case me or any kid, right? Any kid is just not, just doesn't have it in them, right? Maybe they just don't belong in the field, right? So in my case, maybe it, that's a dunce cap in case you didn't know. It's not duke, although that would be dope too, right? My own dunce cap with my initial. <laughs> never thought of that until just this minute. Anyway, that's a dunce cap, right? So maybe the reason that I, is that I didn't, I didn't have that experience in chemistry is that I was actually kind of phony. There was kind of a phony experience up to that point, and I finally discovered that, in fact, I'm not a science person, okay? The other side of that, it's not really a contrast set. It's more like, how does this work on both sides of this educational experience, one of them being the do not enter, the other one being kind of growing into the world, right? On one side is maybe I was a dunce. If I had the good experience, maybe that's like where I was bright. We have all these great a a analogical, metaphorical words, this language for talking about kids who are really capable, bright being the, oh, he's so bright. I like bright actually the best. It's better than gifted because often bright, bright connotes something like maybe there's something undiscovered. They're, they shine. Whereas if somebody's gifted, it's like, oh, they really, some, anyway, we have this language, right? Dunce cap goes to one, dim. Dim, there's a great paper written about 20 years ago about the words that were used at the turn of the 20th century to describe the slow-witted. They included words like dim and idiot, right? And the corresponding words would be bright, right? Gifted. What are the other words we use to describe the people on the right-hand side? What's that? Stellar. Stellar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's funny. Ha-ha. <laughs> <laughs> stellar, love it. Any others? From your own experience? Enrichment. Enriched, enriched. Yeah, these kids get, these kids need enrichment, right? Or maybe they just need remediation. These kids get enrichment, right? Because, okay, anything else? Genius, aha. Genius used to be the name for a situation, now it's the name for a person. That's crazy, too. Quick, quick. What's that? Accelerated, right? Okay. Maybe, but it's so difficult to know. I, I, I used to want to say BS, but I think now I just want to say maybe. But let's explore other options before we rest on this. And on a pers as a personal matter, I think I would reject, as a, forget me personally, I don't want to make it all autobiographical. I have to say I'd have a really hard time with somebody talking about my kids as maybe your kid, your own kid, right? Maybe the reason they're doing poorly in math is they're just, they're just not a math person. Maybe they're a little bit dim. Right? This is not to acknowledge that some kids don't need extra help. And I'm not saying that some kids don't need help. I'm just saying that accepting, understanding the, the, the results of somebody's educational experience in terms of their own psychological armory feels like, feels insufficient. It feels like we can do better. All right, let's move on. Okay, so this one could be a possibility. Um, th I think this thing has to wake up is the problem. There. It could just be that in my case, the situation was better, right? Maybe it was just better for me. Maybe I had a learning style, for example, right? That maybe I just really liked being alone with stuff, headphones on, really engaged in stuff that would fit with all my work with three-speed gears and a whole bunch of other stuff too, right? Maybe it was just that the situation was better. Maybe it wasn't that I was dim-witted or quick, but rather that I just didn't work well in this environment, whereas in this other environment, I worked better. Well, maybe. Again, my answer is maybe. I don't know that when my, I have a learning style. I know what it feels like when it, when it feels right to me, when I feel those roots digging into the world. I don't know what it feels like when I feel like I'm just not a part of things. Maybe. Let's keep going, because I think there's more to say about, let me go back, actually. I think one of the things that's dangerous about this, this other idea about the, the light bulb and the dunce cap is that it actually takes it out of our hands as educators. Isn't that right? We just can't do anything about it. Or we feel like we have to carry a burden. Well, oh, God, I got these kids who are just so far behind in my class. They really need to go to remediation. Or maybe I need to have a remediation session. Right? With this one, I can imagine that we feel a little bit more that's in our sphere of control or our sphere of influence, that we can actually do something about this. We can have, try to create environments that are like this and not like this. Although, having taught in the university for 15 years now, I have to tell you, it's pretty hard to find rooms for 200 people that would enable this rather than this. The architecture is set up for this. Right? So again, it's kind of in our sphere of control. We can do small group stuff. We can have seminars. But really, given the way things are, it's pretty difficult for me to imagine doing much about it. I'm also not sure that's an adequate explanation for at least my own experience. Because I actually do well in, some, in group settings. Right? It's not that I'm a natural learner who likes to be alone. In fact, I've been on sabbatical for two quarters. Half the time, I'm miserable because I haven't talked to anybody. Seriously. That's supposed to be super productive. And I wake up at noon, I'm like, oh my gosh, I can't wait for my kids to get out of school so I can talk to them. Right? Okay. So, I think it's more like this. Let me go as quickly as I can to this point. 
I think this is at least as good in many ways a better situation. Uh, sorry, a better explanation for the difference in my own experience. The reason why one experience was so impoverished and the other one was so enriched, right? Is that when I entered that classroom, it was as if I found myself on a track with lanes and people trying to go faster than other people from one point to another. It was just like that. That's why I didn't feel like I had a place because of the kind of underlying, this is a metaphor, right? But an underlying kind of map of the field. That the way to be good in chemistry was to, get the, was to be, get the right answers and get them first, right? My experience in study groups was, you know, the people who did really well did not want to be in a study group with me. In fact, the people who did really well would, didn't really want to be in a study group at all because they didn't want to share their right answers. Whereas in the other sense, right, the other, my, so metaphorically, my experience with this recording of a conversation sitting in the salt mines of Cumberly. Hall, my experience there was that I had gotten a, I had gotten sort of like some inroads into this otherwise unexplored kind of jungle. The jungle in this case was the conversations among children. I knew a lot about how kids, well, I'd read a lot about how kids work, how conversations work. I'd gotten tons of guidance. In fact, my hand had been held along some very well-worn pathways by people who were really, really knowledgeable, my mentors. But once I got in it, I was in a jungle, right? I was exploring, even if it had already been explored before, even if the area had been explored before, it was upon me to explore it for myself. The kinds of feedback I got were, I got some recommendations about how to move around, but mostly it was like, what are you seeing? That was the kinds of questions I got from my mentor. What are you thinking about? What have you got? And when I went back with this conversation, I said, I think it's all about race. I think these kids are dealing with a race. It seems so obvious. Kids of color talking about a black lawyer and defending the rights of the Ku Klux Klan. As, as, like, seems so obvious. And my advisor said, my mentor said, show me. He didn't say that's right. He didn't say that's wrong. He said, show me. And the minute that I tried to show him, I was like, I got to go back in the field because I can't show you. Turned out it was just my guess. Turned out to be a lot about that and a whole lot more. Why? Because for me, the experience wasn't, I got to get to the finish line faster than the people who are running along next to me, but rather, come with me. I will take you on some roads and some really interesting terrain where your job will be to uncover stuff that might have been uncovered before, but will be uncovered for the first time by you for you. Such a different arrangement, such a different environment, right? Okay, got this? Questions? Thoughts? Yeah. But that is precisely the principal point, right? That we wanted to discover facts. Mm. We wanted motivation to learn. Yeah. But if they are not motivated, ah. they are deserving in any way. Gorgeous. That kind of stuff, how do you deal with that? What are your What are your initial thoughts on that? How? Okay. I'm thinking about motivation, and one of the things about motivation that I think is really that we get in a habit of treating motivation as a cause rather than a consequence. Okay? There's really great research that shows self-confidence is actually a consequence of success, not a cause of success, but we treat it as if it's a cause. If you're self-confident, you'll be successful. It's actually statistically exactly the opposite. If you're successful, you will be self-confident. And being self-confident doesn't actually predict future success. I think the same thing is true of motivation, right? How do we get people to be motivated? I want to say, well, we... To, to do it, well, I, like if we set them up and they do that learning, then they'll be motivated. How do we motivate them? Uh, you put me in this scene, unless I'm pretty sure that I have a chance to place, I'm just not motivated. It's not, it's not me that's not motivated. It's that the environment I'm in doesn't activate me in any way. Now I can say, okay, so the, the, but this isn't going to change. I got to motivate people to do this. Okay, I'm just, uh, what I'm trying to say is my experience, the reason my experience was different, and I think over and over again for children, my own children as well as my students, when they get motivated, it's when we take them into interesting places and then say, what do you see? Right? Motivation not as a cause of their learning, but learning at, but as a consequence of their learning. It's real different, Right? Okay, so I have to move on, and this is not, not cooperating, it's cooperating reluctantly. Um, okay, we talked about this one already. I'll move on to the next. 
Does that feel like a satisfactory answer for now? Uh, I think we can hang longer because I think Good. <laughs> Good. Good. Okay. So, so this is where I think we're getting to part of that answer, but also to the part of the question of what do we, you know, what do we do, right? What do teachers do? Okay. It's more about track, right? I tried to play with this metaphor a little bit. Okay. So what makes it feel, what, this environment, I pointed out the track environment, right? Versus like that track versus the environment that those environments are actually motivating and that they're constitutive of a different learning experience, right? In some ways, I can see the track when I walk into a class. Like, all I have to do is walk in on midterm day when, they, mid, when the midterm results get back and people try to figure out where they are on the curve, right? Super visible. That's how these things get built, right? It feels like a track when I'm looking at the person next to me saying, where did you finish? Sounds just like when I'm on a track, right? What do we do as a teacher? Well, I was directed by Lisa, and I think it's really good advice to talk about how assessment might matter. Um, I'm just going to pose the question and hope we probably won't get a chance to answer much today, but I want to encourage some future conversations. Um, I think it's, it's when, when we do this, when we become these people, these guys, you see them right here, those guys, like when we stand at the end of their educational experience with timers and timing lights, or in our case, with tests and grades and rankings, we make the experience that preceded it into a race. Does that make sense? I'll say it again. When we stand, when we sit at, the, at what feels like a finish line and measure and time and rank, we make the prior experience into what, something that was a race, whether or not that was felt like that at the, at the beginning. What's that mean? It, so what do we do? Well, shit, we still got to, excuse me, we still have to measure, right? We still have to, so maybe we've got to find another way besides being like these guys. I have to tell you that the minute that I walk onto a track with my three children in tow, it is everything I can do not to say, you want to race, right? When we're walking around in the woods, like we're like, oh man, a butterfly, we can stay here all day. The caterpillar, cool. A bug, a leaf, the water, ah. <laughs> we get on the track, my kids run track, we get on the track and I'm like, hey, you want to race? I do. Uh, by the way, I'm not that kind of dad. My, my middle daughter does beat me every time. Okay, but the point is this. When we as teachers act like this, right, when we position ourselves in our actions, in our materials, right, the way that we interact with students, if we are, let's say it this way, if these are our students, when, if the runners are our students, right, and we position ourselves at something that feels like a finish line with a stopwatch and a record book, we're making a track for them to run on, right? Okay, there's a little bit more on this, and it's this. Um, there's a thing, oh, don't do that, that one right there. That's a good one. So when we position ourselves that way, we make it into a track. Um, when we try to build, there's another problem that we, 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 we make as educators, and that is that when we, this is a rear view mirror, right? There's a thing called a hindsight bias. It's a, in psychology, it's a version of hindsight bias, or maybe it's a version of the curse of knowledge. The idea is, no matter, wherever we are in a field, when we look back on our own learning, we often make the mistake of thinking we've moved in a straight line or in something like an easy line. We forget the twists and turns and the false starts, right? And so when we build experiences for students, we often build them as step-by-step -step straight lines, even though if we were to analyze our own autobiographical learning, right, autobiographical experience, that's not in fact how we learned it. Maybe how we move through school, that's not the same thing. We make this fundamental error that we look at the distance from where we began to where we are now, and we think that it was either a straight line or a series of straight lines, or at least smooth curves, and we forget that there are all these stops and starts. So when we look back, we see a trail behind us, and then we build experiences like that. So think, put those two things together. What are you gonna get if you're not gonna get a track? We build a narrow lane, and then we sit at the finish line. We build a narrow lane because we want good things for students, and we look at our own experiences and say, well, that's how you'd get from that point to here. And then, but what we do is we build tracks for our students. And when they get on those tracks, they're gonna feel like they're in a race. And when they feel like they're in a race, if they don't feel like they're gonna win, if they have a reasonable bone in their bodies, they're not gonna do it. Okay, 
I'm going to finish up here. There's an alternative way of being with students, rather than sitting at the finish line, being this guy, okay, the co-driver. That's real different than sitting on a finish line, isn't it? The blue circle will come up in a second, I hope. So that guy. Right? What if we tried to be present for our students in that way? I know there's still a racetrack, but if you've ever watched rally cars, they don't often all stay on the track. Um, but if you're that, what it, would, what it would be like if instead of saying at the finish line, we were a co-driver. And the, you know what the co-driver, if you ever listen to this, you should listen to some of the audio on YouTube or something. It's a gas, man. The co-driver is constantly saying, like, turn here. There's a left turn. Oh! <laughs> because the co-driver is giving input, but the driver is still driving. Right? So just as a kind of provocative metaphor, what, if, what would it look like if we took on the role of co-driver? doesn't mean we haven't traveled the route before. In fact, the only co-driver I want is somebody who really knows the road ahead. But my experience of that road is going to be very different if, we, if the educator is more like a co-driver than the timer. Okay? Now, and then the last one is this. This is one of my favorite one. And it's this. What if our relationship was kind of like mission control? when the astronauts went to the moon, right? This is Apollo 13. This is a real image. When they were trying to figure out the problem, there was some oxygen problem in there. What if our job was to check in? Like, what would it look like if, if maybe instead of, or at least in addition to being at the finish line, what if our job was to occasionally check in and say, you know, how are things going? Houston, we have a problem. What's the problem? We don't say, what's the matter with you? Can you imagine if Apollo 13, they said, Houston, we have a problem. We're like, what the hell's the matter with you? Are you, are you dim? No, the answer was, what's the problem? What do you see? The, the, we, the, the, uh, the mission control sought the problem definition from the astronaut's own experience, right? What do you see? What's going on? Tell us everything. We will try to give you, we'll invent something for your situation. What would that be like? If as, rather, as educators, we were saying, what are you seeing? What are you doing? What are you thinking about? What's happening for you? Show me. Remember that one? Show me. And then we saw it as our job to try to respond with resources that fit not that person's psychology, but that person's experience, immediate situation with whatever the subject matter was. Now, I know this is pretty metaphorical, and my time is just about up. But I want us to go forward with that question about um, with just what would it mean for us to take this kind of a stance? I have some answers. I've been working on it for a while. Um, to take this kind of a stance toward our students and their educational experience. I, like I said, I have some answers. I'd love to talk about it more, but I suspect we'll have to do that maybe in an online chat or something. I think I'm done.